panel, our speaker today is Liana Kong. And Liana previously was, she's a product designer and she was previously at Cruise Self-Driving Cars, defining hardware interactions for the Cruise Origin, as well as the device interaction design team at Google Nest. And she has a passion for designing the space between people and the physical objects around them. And when she's not designing, she makes clay bases through her studio, Lil Lily Buds. And she's an alum of our product design program. So. Thank you. Should I talk through this mic? That's good. Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, as I just said, I am Leanna. I am um, an alum from 2015. That was nine years ago. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm a hardware interaction designer based in San Francisco. Uh, so I wanted to start my presentation about how I got here. Um, I grew up in a really small town in Ohio, <laughs> uh, really in the middle of nowhere, like population like 5,000 people. Um, but in you know in boredom sparks creativity. Um, I always loved art. I um, but like any child of immigrants, I had to find a way to make money. <laughs> so I asked my art teacher at the time, I was making a sculpture, I always loved sculpture. Um, how can I do this but make a living out of it? And he said, study industrial design. So I came to CMU to study industrial design. This is me in the sophomore studio. There's a couple of people in the background of this photo who are here in the audience. Or I think this whole row are all really good friends. Um, I studied industrial design for my love of craft and tactility and making things. And when making this presentation, I thought it'd be really interesting to show you some of my student work and sort of the threads that have gotten me from being here at CMU to my <coughs> professional career now. And it was a really illuminating experience to uh, retrace the steps of my career. Um, and you're all very lucky because some of these have not been seen in maybe 10 years and I've had, you know, hidden away in an archive for a very long time. Um, so yeah, uh, my first introduction into physical interactions was this lamp project in sophomore year for Bruce's studio. Uh, we had to make a lamp based on a quote about light. And at the time, it was one of my favorite work, uh, favorite projects to work on, but I didn't really tap into why. I was, it was still sophomore year, sort of exploring the space <coughs> of the discipline of industrial design. Um, and towards the end of sophomore year, between sophomore year and junior year, I was losing a little bit of steam, I think, uh, you know, starting to feel the pressure of thinking about what was going to be my life after graduating. It was kind of like, you know, the halfway point of college. And uh, uh, that summer, I could only get an internship at a uh, like this graphic design studio near my hometown. It was unpaid and didn't have a working bathroom, uh, but I considered it a foot in the door. Uh, I, I was just generally like feeling a little lost because I, I saw a lot of people graduating. Uh, going into UX, and I, I had no idea what UX was. I, I re distinctly remember Google searching software as a term, like not even knowing what that <laughs> meant. Um, but I was like, hey, if I go into UX, maybe it'll help me pay my student loans. <laughs> so I came back um, junior year uh, to diversify my portfolio with more UX-related projects. Even though I wasn't, you know, necessarily super passionate about it, it was more so uh, diversifying my portfolio. And really, I was just trying to cater my portfolio to get a job, to get an internship. And I, I genuinely forgot about this project. It was a wearable project that I, you know, I, I was like, oh, wearables are hot. This was pre-Apple Watch. And this was the only thing I could think of that had hardware so I could put it in my ID studio but with a software twist, aka making this like really janky app. Uh, <laughs> and that same year, in um, spring semester, junior year, I took experimental form, Mark's experimental form class. And one of the finals, or the final uh, project is to make a, a radio, which is, you know, a, you know, some, anything that can turn off and on, change volume, and tune stations. And I was sitting in Reese, 
with my friend Rachel over here uh, while she was working her shift and I was like, I don't know what to do. I'm just gonna doodle on this whiteboard. And I made, uh, I drew like a little guy in a, in a poncho. Uh, and I was like, okay, I'll make a poncho radio. Uh, it's a wearable. Uh, and you know, ponchos are really easy to draw because uh, you don't have to draw people's arms. Um, <laughs> but in this, uh, creating this project, something lit in me where you can really have fun making physical interactions and integrating them into everyday objects. But I filed away this project as something that was, you know, silly and fun. It was really a joke. Um, but And I would keep it on my website, but it was never something I actually interviewed with. So fast forward that summer, uh, remember that wearable project? <laughs> it helped me land my first big internship at Pebble, which was one of the first smartwatch companies. And I was the UX intern working under the industrial design team. And that's where I met my partner, who was the ID intern. <laughs> um, and that's where it really clicked for me that you can design the experience between a person and a product and that I could actually see a career in it. Like I was getting paid to do that thing that I really liked. And I thought to myself, maybe I don't want to be an industrial designer, but I do love working next to them. I do love being still in the physical space. Um, my project uh, for that summer was to explore the use of a colored screen. At the time, we only had an e-ink black and white display. And um, they were like, hey, we have this low-res 8-bit color display, figure out what we can do with it. So one of the manifestations of me sort of exploring color on this tiny screen was a watch face generating app. And working within those constraints was really exciting for me, especially on a form factor that wasn't typical of a smartphone or a computer screen. So I would go from here and say, I love designing experiences on tiny screens. <laughs> So I went back my senior year and really took the reins with my capstone project. I knew there, there was an opportunity in the space between the physical and the digital, so I swung fully back to physical because that was what I was passionate about. And I was like, if I'm going to devote my entire year to one project, I might as well really love it. And I revisited an interactive musical project from my junior year that was um, this musical toy car. And Thinking about what was next for me, and you know, finding the stress of finding the stress of finding a job post grad, I knew I didn't want to go back to wearables. I think Apple Watch was just coming out, um, but I remembered Nest uh, as being a really cool product. It was actually in breast class freshman year. It was used in it as an uh, an example of really good design. So it was always something in the back of my head that. Um, you know, that's like a, a hardware, a piece of hardware that has a really interesting interaction model. So every time they came to campus, I would slip them my resume, even though they weren't there for engineers. Um, and come uh, interview time, you know, I didn't get to show the final product of my capstone project, but I would bring this like Arduino board, laser cut, acrylic thing to my interviews and sort of show them the process that I was going through. Um, even though I'm really proud of the final, uh, the final product of my senior capstone, many people didn't actually see that manifest. All of my interviews were showing my process sketches, uh, ideation, and all the research I was doing with professors' kids. So the next time that Ness came to campus was Confluence. Uh, uh, I got the chance to interview with them on, uh, at an on-site. And you know, maybe I didn't have the most relevant portfolio, but they gave me a design challenge to design a hotel experience. And I made this you know, like interactive mirror that was also a screen. And I wanted to show my interest in designing interfaces and physical, ex and physical spaces that wasn't just like a phone app. Uh, which looking back, this has a lot of foreshadowing to the future work that I, I have. And walking out of my on-site, the recruiter told me the reason I got noticed was because of my poncho project. And I was like, people actually look at it, that's so embarrassing. But I was known as like poncho girl for a little bit. <laughs> so if you know, if you have a silly project that you really enjoyed and even though you think it's really silly, it actually might get you a job. So I did get the job. And I was deciding between a few offers um, that spring, but ultimately picked Nest because I wanted to work on hardware. And I was there for a total of six years. Uh, Nest at the time was a, an independent company. It's now part of Google. 
But pre-merge, I mostly worked on app ecosystems, and it was really grunt work, like I was working on settings. <laughs> and But I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never shipped an app. I'd never like, really worked on UX. I thought I knew what UX was, but I really didn't. Um, and you know, I got that under my belt, and slowly I was starting to be able to lead end-to-end -end experiences for hardware from zero. So one of my first um, full experience designing something, a hardware piece with a software element, were these little temperature sensors. And at the time on the team, there was only one guy who worked on hardware interactions, and he sort of took me under his wing because he needed help. We had a lot of products at the time. And uh, I had you know, been showing a keen interest. So a lot of other people on my team had tried working on hardware UX, but they were like, I hate this. <laughs> I don't ever want to do this again. But you know, I kept coming back and being like, this is what I want to focus on. Um, but context switching between working on software and hardware wasn't very efficient at all. And the more I worked on hardware, the less I wanted to work on software. Because that's why I came to Nest, ultimately. And in 2018, there was this huge shift uh, where Google and Nest were merging Google Home. And I had the, like, everyone was leaving because it was like chaos. And um, my manager at the time was like, okay, Leanna, what do you want to work on? And I said, hey, I've been here for a few years. I've been doing hardware UX 50-50, but I want to focus on it full time. And it's important to note, like, at the time my role didn't exist. There was always people working on hardware, but it was always with you know, working on the app or working on a website as well. Um, so I had to work and define why it was necessary to have a dedicated designer on hardware. And this became a greater issue because as we merged, our portfolio nearly tripled and we needed to align the Nest and the Google Home hardware language really quickly. So I guess this was like somewhere in 2018 after I had declared I was 100% on hardware, my mentor left. And he was like, you got this, you're fine, bye. <laughs> and I was left to build up the hardware interaction design, we called it um, physical UX, um, as a discipline at Google. Um, and it wasn't easy, it was like a very rude awakening coming from the software world to purely hardware. With software, you can always fix your mistakes. With hardware, once a decision is made, it's completely set. And being a woman in hardware was very difficult. I was often asked why I was there, and I many times had to prove my worth and you know as a um, a young woman designer that was a, like a huge learning curve for me to really stand my ground and so many times I really wanted to give up I was like why am I doing this but I was in this specialty of my own making that I was uh, you know really passionate about so I was determined to make it work and I got really good at it I had you know eight products from end to end under my belt in my portfolio. Um, you know, you stay at a job as long as you think that your portfolio is being built up well enough that you can showcase the work that you have, you have done. Um, and I became a veteran hardware interaction designer and I was working on three to four vastly different products at the same time. So this was about six years in um, and it was the height of the pandemic and my mental health was not so good and I was very burnt out after working so hard to, you know, to establish my discipline. And I really needed a change of scene. It was my first job out of school. All I knew was smart home. Um, and I was like, what else, where else can I do this type of work? Uh, so that's when I joined Cruise, which is an autonomous vehicle company. And it wasn't pro uh, smart home products. It was outside of the home. It was very different. And I got to focus on one product. Uh, I wasn't working on three to four different products at the same time. I was only working on this purpose-built um, autonomous vehicle. And I really wanted to try out the startup life, going from Google to this uh, sort of mid-sized startup. And uh, it was the most difficult thing I've ever worked on, um, from a service design, transportation, regulatory perspective. People are very... Um, hesitant about autonomous vehicles and there isn't very much to base your work off of so it's really like defining the future of transportation and working in the auto industry was very different from tech so you know kind of getting that different space still doing very similar work and sort of teaching um, a very large team how to work with hardware if many of them hadn't before um, and it was super fun this was my team I really love them a lot uh, and then I got laid off 
<laughs> in December. But it's been it's been really nice, actually. Um, I said before I, I have been working very hard since graduating, and um, that I see it as a sort of sabbatical, and I kind of you know I get to do fun things like do this talk. And it's important to note that I don't think about design 24-7. Uh, leaving college, I really needed a hobby to stick to. I've always been a baker. Um, and then two and a half years ago, when I was starting my new job at Cruise, I needed a way to leave the house, so I took a pottery class and I was hooked. It was like a really nice breath, breath of fresh air um, to leave my computer and make something for no one but myself. And most importantly, to be bad at something and to continuously focus on improving your craft and having a very solid representation of improvement. And now on my time off, I've just been focusing on pottery and teaching classes, working on commissions. And last year I was in Milan Design Week for these blue vases, so that was really exciting. So that was me, how I got here, and that's how why I'm here today, back to my day job of being a hardware interaction designer. Uh, I just want to do like a quick um, crash course on the type of work that I do. Uh, hardware interaction design defines a product's physical interactions, integrates it into the end-to-end -end, end user experience, and ensures consistency within an ecosystem. So anything that has to do with hardware, so buttons, touch, haptics, audio, choosing hardware components, hardware product quality, etc. Where does someone like me fit in a design team? I rarely work alone, and as you probably guessed, I'm right in the middle between industrial design and UX, so I work very closely with both. Um, and they say hardware is hard. It takes a dozen of people, it takes dozens of people to et et execute a hardware product. Um, these don't even include the prototyping and hardware engineers I work very closely with. Um, I'm just going to give you a really practical example of hardware interaction design. So take crossing a street. Uh, these are all hardware interactions. You are touching the button to indicate that you want to cross the street. You see the walk signs to tell you that it's time to cross the street. And oftentimes there is an audio component um, that says, like, walk sign is on or beep, boop, beep, boop. Um, <laughs> but behind all of these interactions are dozens of decisions, button height, size, tactility lighting brightness, color, the exact pitch of sound, and the cadence in which there is sound versus um, voice. And the amazing thing about designing in physical spaces is the ability to provide multiple dimensions of affordances for accessibility and inclusion. For example, with this, um, this button, it's set at a certain height, size, and tactility um, for uh, generally for wheelchair users so that they can reach the button, but it's also helpful for those who might be holding groceries, or a baby, or they don't have free hands. Um, you don't have to be able to read to understand cross, crosswalk signs. You can see that person's walking, so I guess I'll walk. Or even if you are, you know, hard of, you have you know, poor vision. If I see this red hand, maybe it's blurry from afar, I know that it means don't walk. <laughs> and even though the crosswalk signs are designed for people with vision impairments, they help people who are on their phone or distracted, you probably been you know scrolling on Instagram waiting for the walk sign to turn on and you totally miss it but the the audio helps you in those scenarios too so I'm just gonna dive deep into a little deeper into my actual work um, and I'm gonna I would like to say that my work is translating intangibles to the to the tangible aka taking a design idea to a physical execution. And I'll dig into a case study to show you how I translated a user need into something that the hardware team could execute on. Um, when you work on hardware, you have to make decisions 18, 24 months in advance before a product launches. And that's often when you know, other UX designers aren't working on it. It's totally focused on by the hardware team. And while the timeline is long, decisions are set. Hardware is hard, like I said, and it's very difficult to change your mind halfway through the process. A lot of my job is translating a user need to a hardware experience. For example, with this thermostat, it was about making a low-cost, high-quality product that had a sense of magic. It blended into your home instead of being an appliance stuck on your wall. I specifically worked on making this mirror hide the screen behind it, while also meeting accessibility minimums. Um, and I learned a lot about manufacturing glass. 
And then for the cruise origin, it was almost the opposite. Here's this huge vehicle that looks like nothing anyone's ever seen before. There's no driver to help you. How do you make a robot car feel like it's going to take care of you, that it's trustworthy and that you're in control? These are all really thorny problems with a lot of technical constraints and different players with different motivations and needs. And in the instance of Cruise, I was working with General Motors and Honda to create a cohesive vehicle at Cruise. So grappling with two automotive giants with this um, tech startup was no easy feat. But it's always important to bring back the user, uh, bring it back to user needs and be an advocate for the people you're making the product for. Um, this was the wheelchair accessible vehicle that I worked on that cruise. That was probably one of my favorite ones to work on um, and uh, one of my favorite projects. And all of these are examples of massive experiences with hundreds of interactions, many of which are tied to a piece of hardware. So let's take a step back to Nest. One of the reasons I joined Nest was because it gave unloved objects in your home the attention it deserved. But that doesn't mean bombarding your home with smart home products that look like robots and blink blue lights at you at night. Um, I'm in an Airbnb, Airbnb right now with like a USB charger that has like an always on blue light and it drives me bonkers. Anyway, so <laughs> at Nest there's an emphasis on quiet technology that blends into the home and has highly considered details. The home is one of the most intimate spaces one occupies. Um, and Nest design language has an emphasis on warmth and comfort. And um, one, of, one of my favorite things about Nest is that the products aren't meant to be replaced every year. It's not like a phone. These are things that are there for five, ten years or more. So you want to make it as good as possible for as long as possible. For, day, for today, I'm going to dive deep into the Nest battery doorbell. It's a pretty unique case study to do um, in that it needs to blend into the home, but it also needs to call attention to itself. It's also an outdoor product. And it's for the people living inside the house, but anyone who comes to visit and might not be familiar with it. For context, this was our very first battery-powered product. And in an effort to make our products more accessible, um, we were selling this at a lower price point. So. One, it was energy constrained, and it was also cost constrained, two very um, new constraints that we hadn't um, encountered with at Nest yet. I worked on dozens of components of this doorbell, like <clears throat> picking the right type of camera sensor to get the best field of view, like just being able to see this doormat was a huge deal. Um, button tactility, it should feel the same wherever you're pressing the button. The installation process, a lot of Nest products are DIY. You can have it um, professionally installed, but we always assume it's someone who just has a screwdriver at home. How do we make it easy for them? This was a battery product, so the charging pro process. Even very high-level concepts like hardware privacy, it's a camera in a public space. How do we ensure privacy? But for today, I'm just going to focus on the button, and specifically the light ring. Um, from an industrial design standpoint, there are many decisions as to why the doorbell button is flush and where it is where it is. Um, we wanted to keep the body slim. We couldn't have a concave button because of the components behind it, specifically the battery. Um, a convex button also presented similar issues that I won't get into too much detail about today. Um, but to summarize the point of this button, the only action a person needs to take with this is to press it. But the challenge was that this light was one of the only affordances to help guide you to that. Uh, so that's where I came in. And if you were to boil down my goal of this light ring, it would be to make it visible. I need to be able to see this button. I need to be able to notice it. And that sounds simple enough. But if I went to an engineer and said, make it visible, like, they would be like, how bright should this be or how should this look? And I said, make it visible, they would laugh in my face. That doesn't mean anything to them. It's very subjective and, and difficult to quantify. Um, so I've broken down what visible meant into these requirements that, we'll, that I'll get into in a moment. Um, some context is that we had a previous doorbell model, but much of the specifications weren't recorded or kind of lost in time. Remember when that merge happened? A lot of people left. Uh, we couldn't just copy what we had done before, and this was all, also like a very com uh, different product under the hood. 
So I started from square one, and like any design problem, you start with the who. Who is this for? Uh, you can expect someone who's never seen a doorbell uh, before to use it. Uh, it's also for frequent users like my mailman or anyone who visits my house. And as someone who owns the doorbell, it's also for me. I need to see who's at the door. When this light is on, it means that the camera is recording. Next, where does this live? I needed to know about where the doorbell could be installed in homes across the country and the world. Uh, this image shows a previous doorbell product, and we were able to survey our users uh, for exact data on installation height and location. And we collected uh, what people's front doors looked like, where their doorbells were placed, visited other people's houses, and conducted interviews did um, some competitive analysis with some competitor products. So I have my where and my who, now we get to the when, light up at the right time. It's a battery device, so unlike our previous version, we couldn't have the light on at all times. And if it's lighting up as soon as you press it, it's too late, or maybe someone didn't even find the button. Um, we had this passive infrared sensor that would detect motion, and also a camera sensor to see if the person was in view. And these provided some technical constraints around sensor detection, camera machine learning, and latency, um, in that uh, if we see a person, turn on the light. Uh, but there are some constraints there that, uh, you know, I don't want to get into the technical weeds there. But due to those constraints, we can only detect a person from 10 feet away, depending on how they were walking towards the door. Um, and then uh, I would take the average walking speed of three feet a second, and with that, we could infer we only had a few seconds to catch um, someone's attention. So I had, to create, recruit, I had to create really hard requirements that would say something like, a user, a user should be able to clearly see the light ring from, what does it say, five feet away. <laughs> and why five feet? Five feet is uh, one step away from arm's distance. And all of, this, all of this was so that the hardware team could take the requirement and execute it. But for me, it was turning the back-end constraints to all of these sensors and turning it into a clear user story. But it goes deeper in that than that. There are many positions and angles in which a doorbell can be installed, and that changes how a person is detected and how they see this button. So on top of that, the direction of travel, where someone's walkway is, um, that all impacts how quickly we can see someone and how quickly someone can see the doorbell. So I also had to specify the button needs to be visible from these degrees off and on access, uh, axis. Um, at one point, you could only see the light when you're looking at it straight on, and we're like, hey, you can't see it if you like step a foot to the side. So I had to give them very specific, like 14 to 25 degrees off axis, I need to be able to see this doorbell that's um, mounted at three feet for you know some people in these range of heights. So we get, we've gotten the who, the where, the when, now we get to the what. Now we have to make it bright enough. Um, but what is bright enough? One of the first things I had to dive into was understanding ambient outdoor brightnesses. And I would go around outside measuring lux values. Lux is the measurement of ambient light um, in different weather, reflecting different surfaces like a white wall versus asphalt. And I made those hard requirements as well. I couldn't say, make it as bright as possible. They would come back to me and say, OK, but when, in what environment, from how far away? These are the electrical constraints we have in making it this bright. With light, the only existing things that are brighter than direct sunlight are car headlights. <laughs> and these were teeny tiny LEDs, or eight little LEDs in this, behind this little um, strip, this circle. So I had to give the team an upper limit of what brightest meant. It's also important to note that I learned all of this on the job. <laughs> so um, it was really going from like, what is bright? What does bright mean? How do I translate that into a technical term that can be executed upon? So we had the constraints, the user scenarios, the UX requirements, and the hard numbers. And now we had to mass produce it and do it thousands of times. You want a consistent product from unit to unit. And one of the most difficult things to execute in hardware is product quality. And on top of that, we're getting to the fun part of making it beautiful. Um, when ma manufacturing something, you're going to expect variability. And as a product goes through dozens of checks and tests before it makes it to the end of the assembly line, there are still hundreds of components. And if one is slightly off, it will change the end result. 
but that doesn't necessarily mean you completely trash the whole thing just because the light ring is a little dim. Um, we had to set standards of what we accepted and what we rejected. And part of my job was to head to the factory and validate the specs I set right off the line. So they would give me a freshly assembled doorbell and I would say yes or no. And in this, in this scenario, we set up a 10,000 K lux or 10,000 lux environment in the factory using these really bright lights. <laughs> Um, but we also had to look at it in other scenarios. So how does that perceived color and uniformity change throughout the day versus the nighttime? I spent a lot of my time at Nest in a dark room just staring at lights. Um, you'll see here that our previous doorbell on the far right uh, was a lot bluer than the new one. Um, going back to that you know, warm um, design language that Nest has. But brightness wasn't the only thing I needed to give input on. Uniformity was really tricky because we only had eight LEDs spread across a very large area and the goal was such that a person couldn't tell what's under the hood, how many LEDs are under there. Um, it gives a sense of magic and cleanliness. Um, adjusting, we would you know, adjust the transmissivity of the light guard. These are these little pieces of plastic. Um, so it, outside of brightness, color temperature, uniformity, does this look white <laughs> was really important. And again, this goes back to the Nest brand of having something warm and welcoming. It's a light that isn't grinding or isn't too clinical when you walk up to someone's house. And in the end, all those elements impacted brightness and perceived quality. On top of that, color and uniformity changed across different CMF, different colors of the body. For example, darker colors had contrast. If, you know, shining a white light through a white body is really difficult to make it visible because it's white on white. Um, and then the dark bodies also heated easier, overheated easier, so we couldn't power the LEDs as strongly. For example, in Arizona where it gets over like 100 degrees, these can get too hot and shut down. Um, another interesting thing is that like the gray CMF made, or the gray uh, version made the LEDs look kind of purple, so we put yellower LEDs so we wouldn't, that we otherwise wouldn't put in the white CMF. Um, and all these were considerations we had to make to produce thousands of the same thing that live in a wide range, range of environments and making sure we were um, executing on a high quality product. So we had a light that would come on the right time, it was bright enough, it was beautiful and warm and uniform. Now we get to my bread and butter, which is what does this light say? So communicating to people via physical interfaces without using words. And in this case, it's a light. If you walked up to this at someone's door and the button was going off like this, it's too fast, it's jarring, it looks broken, I'm kind of scared to press it. Um, but if it's too slow, you might miss it. You're not going to just be staring at this doorbell wondering what it's doing. Glanceability is really important. So there's something about finding the sweet spot of what is just right, um, and that's part of you know the craft of my work. It needs to be uh, enough to be passively consumed, so it's not annoying, but enough to catch your attention. Those are the two ends of the spectrum to really think about. The same thing applies to other animations. What else does this button have to say? In this case, after you press the button, the light ring spins to say, I'm waiting. But I can't just hand off a GIF and tell my engineers to make it. I can't just say, make it spin. Um, I had to get really creative in visualizing how each LED would behave in a way that engineering understood and can, could implement. For example, I would play with rotating speeds until I was happy with it, and in this case, we have the visualization of one looping and rotate animation that takes 800 milliseconds total. So it'd be turning on and off each individual LED at different intervals. So back to making it visible, just as a summary. I took the user need, the why, I dissect, dissected it into the who, the what, the when, the where and set the requirements in a way that could be physically as executed at a mass scale. Um, but what I didn't show was continuous testing and qualitative and quantitative research that happened between every decision we made. In many cases, you'll be making hardware decisions before you can get to get a product into users' hands, and the risk is very high. It's like millions of dollars. So every, every step I showed you was just to get to the point of manufacturability in order for us to validate our decisions with our testers. 
you might be thinking, okay, Liana, you worked on one button. <laughs> but like I said earlier, the button was just one of a dozen components that I had a hand in creating for this one product. If I were to say my design superpower, it would be my ability to care deeply about the details, but also my ability to take a step back and assess the bigger picture of how a product works in an ecosystem. While working on the Sorbel, again, I was working on three to four of the Nest products and making sure all the hardware interactions worked cohesively amongst all of them. Um, oftentimes, as designers, you're asked, what's the business need for XYZ? Why does it have to be pretty? Why do we need to spend money on making this light ring the best it can be? And as designers, it's our job to uphold those decisions, even though they can feel a little subjective and squishy. Um, most people don't no notice details consciously, but subconsciously they do. And if all of the details are except, uh, correct except for one, you won't really know why something's off, but you'll feel like something's off. <laughs> kind of like when you're making soup and it's missing a little bit of a spice or an herb. Um, so this goes back to what motivates me in design. The craft of design is very rewarding and something you can look back on and be proud of. And there's something fulfilling about caring about things that most people don't. I think like the best feeling is seeing a product and it just works. And no one's ever gonna think about, oh, I wonder how many hours Leanna put into making that light ring really beautiful. <laughs> so in closing, that's a glimpse of the type of work I work on, one very small smidgen of, of you know, the grand scheme of things. And even though my, a lot of my work ended up being quite technical. I've never thought of myself as a technical person, like I don't know how to code. <laughs> Everything I do is from a craving to understand human needs, to focus on my craft, and the fulfillment of making. And the essence of what excites me about design is creating the physical manifestation of a feeling. So in term, in, for the light ring, it was just a sense of magic. And in the case of a cake, it's joy and celebration. In the case of a really nice pot, it's an extension of myself and what pleases me. So hindsight is 2020. By looking back at all of these, they have very direct parallels to a lot of my professional work. Um, when I was working on these projects, I never stopped to think exactly what about it I, I enjoyed besides you know, making it. There was always something at the tip of my tongue that I could only describe as working on hardware. And, uh, I you know, didn't really discover the, what the real answer was until a few years later. With this lamp, I'm an LED expert now. Um, with this radio, I'm, I work on physical interactions. Uh, with my capstone project, I worked on a robot car. But if I were to give you a parting advice to the students here, don't try to just make things to cater to others. You're not gonna enjoy it. Find what makes you passionate. And in my case, I had an inkling of an idea of what my passion was, and I you know, didn't truly unlock it until a few years later. Because who knows something that you enjoyed making but filed away as a silly joke might be the thing that ignites your career, like my poncho. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>